Try not to form an opinion until you ride one. And then you go, oh my God, that's what everybody is talking about. But it's very addictive. It is so smooth. Welcome to that episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Today, one of the most loved, hated, smoothest running, reviled, coolest looking, I hate the way it looks, motorcycles. The Suzuki RE5. This was a game changer, always going to be a game changer. They had such high hopes for this. You know, the Wankel engine was the big thing in the 70s. Dr. Felix Wankel developed this after World War II. I would say he was a great engineer, which he was, but he was also a Nazi. I mean, a real Nazi, not one of those guys, I'm just following orders Nazis. I mean, one of those Hitler's my best friend Nazis. So it's, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, to have any kind of feelings for the guy. But that being said, he was an interesting engineer. And the Wankel engine, General Motors bought the patent for it. Uh, well, Mazda, certainly, they're the ones that ran with it and made it, made it run. But everybody did. Everybody wanted to have a Wankel because it looked like the future. Because with a piston engine, you know, you're changing direction every millisecond. The piston goes down, comes back, comes down, comes back. Of course, this causes vibration. With a Wankel, all the parts are moving in the same direction. If you don't know what a Wankel looks like or how, let me show you what we have here. To kind of show you how a Wankel works. For lack of a better word, let's say this is your cylinder and this is your piston. Now, you know, in an internal combustion engine, the piston, as I said, goes up and down. With this, the piston turns constantly in just one direction. It does not change directions, so consequently, it's incredible, incredibly smooth. This is essentially your combustion chamber right here. Your spark plug goes right in there. And what happened was, as this turns, bang, it goes around, and then the exhaust gases exit out the side. So you don't have a lot of moving parts. But although I'm not turning it very smoothly, you sort of get the idea. Well, let me show you, let me show you how smooth this engine is. Put that down a second. Watch the mirror. Now, see if you can tell me when the engine starts. Tell me if you notice any vibration at all. That's 7,000 RPM. And that's the genius of the Wankel engine, just incredibly smooth. This is the equivalency of 500 cc's. That's the way they sort of, I guess they judge it by combustion area or whatever. Uh, and it's interesting, but motorcyclists are pretty conservative people. You know, when Harley came out with the knucklehead in 36, they only built a few of them because they were afraid it was too high tech. People like the flathead, they like the three speed. This bike came along, overhead valves, Four speed, oh, this thing is a little too uh, high tech. You know, you know how Porsche keeps building the 911 and Harley keeps making a V twin that's kind of the same? Uh, we, that's the way motorcyclists are. Triumphs still look like triumphs. Even when you buy a modern Triumph motorcycle, the fuel injection system looks like Amol carburetors from the 60s because that's what motorcycles look like. And this, in no way, shape, or form, looked like a traditional motorcycle engine. That being said, Suzuki really threw everything at this. All their technical guys, they worked night and day on, on this project. And when it was released, it got great reviews. It was incredibly smooth. People thought it handled really well. It was really a good handling bike. Uh, and all the road testers liked it. They said, oh, that's the future of motorcycles. You know, this kind of smooth riding. You could go, you know, San Francisco to New York City, blah, 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 all this. Ah, it just didn't catch on. There are a lot of teething problems with it. Uh, with the emissions of the 70s, they tended to run, they had to run extra lean because these, it sounds like a two-stroke and it's sort of polluted like a two-stroke and they tended to use a quarter oil every three, four hundred miles, something like that. Gas mileage was not good, 25 to 30, which was really bad for a motorcycle. It wasn't an out and out fast bike. Top speed was about 110, 112. Uh, not that most people went that fast, but you know, bikers, it didn't have a lot of the street cred, as they say. 
uh, had uh, twin discs in front, even had a Kickstarter, which is unusual, but uh, a kickstarting wankle, which is kind of funny. Because uh, bikes, a lot of bikes still had Kickstarters in 75. They brought in Jajaro, the famous Italian stylist, to do the design, this sort of rocket ship. Look, when you turn the key, see what happens here? Watch the dashboard. Oh, the ooh. It just has that sort of Buck Rogers meets Ming kind of look to it here. That's I said, hydraulic disc brakes. You had a drum in the back. The handling was, it was actually good. They thought it was one of the best handling bikes of the 70s. It was not lightweight, but it wasn't a heavyweight either. Wankel engines tend to be a lot lighter. Uh, the shock setup looks a bit strange, but that's the way they had to have it almost up and down like that because any other way, there, I can't remember what it was, the torque or something, although these are not high torque engines. I don't remember the exact reason for that. Um, yeah, and they released the bike and bikers just thought it was too strange. Remember, this is the 70s. Uh, you had a lot of bikers that were World War II veterans and consequently, an American bike was better than a Japanese bike because, uh, you know, they fought them in the war. And the Japanese still had a reputation in the early days. By the 70s, it was disappearing, but it still existed that uh, Japanese products were not particularly well made. Uh, Honda quickly changed that, of course, but it was still a transition period. So when this came out, people just thought, what? What? You know, it wasn't a torque monster like a Harley or somebody could dump the clutch and do burnouts and wheelies. It was just an incredibly smooth, wonderful riding motorcycle that handled pretty good. And that's exactly what it did. But when people heard it was the equivalent of 500 cc's for, what was it, $2,400, $2,500, which was Harley money or, you know, big bike money. Uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to people. Consequently, this bike almost bankrupted Suzuki. It almost put them out of business. You, luckily, they had the 750 Water Buffalo and some of the other bikes uh, to kind of get them through it, X6 Hustler and all that stuff. They were a very innovative company, very smart company. Uh, when I got this one, I've had this, God, a long time. <laughs> yeah. I didn't buy it new, but as you can see, it's just about new. It's all original paint. Uh, these mufflers were interesting. Notice you have an air intake at the front of the muffler. You see this here? Because Wankels run so hot, they produce so much heat, the Japanese were so frightened that Americans would sue because a passenger might burn their legs. So you had this heat guard right here combined with a double wall muffler. The, the air would come in the front and cool the pipe and go out the back. It was pretty innovative, interesting. Not the best looking setup, but it was okay. It was tolerable. So there's just a lot of problems like that. Plus they ran incredibly lean. When I got this one, it ran hot all the time. We had to pull the carburetor, lean it out, do some modifications until we finally got it right. And I must say, it makes a great classic bike because A, people have no idea what it is. I mean, I meet bikers all the time and go, what is, what is, a what? A wanker, who built it? What did, is that experimental? No, no, it was a bike that came out with it. You know, no, it didn't go very well. In fact, Suzuki uh, does not even have one in their museum, from what I understand, because I think they were just embarrassed by the huge failure of it. And I'm told all the spare parts of these were just put in a dump truck and dumped in the ocean somewhere off the coast of Japan because to make a reef or something, because they just, they were just stunned at how poorly it was accepted, which was a shame because it was innovative, it was different, you know, like the Chrysler Airflow, like the Harley Knucklehead. It's hard to sell something before it's time. You know, people just weren't ready for this. Uh, I think with the, also, you know what else killed this? The gas crisis of the 70s even though gas went from 28 cents a gallon to a dollar a gallon. Oh my God, it's the end of the world. The fact is it only got 25 miles per gallon, not even as good as a Volkswagen. People said, well, why would I want that? An engine I never heard of from a maker I'm not familiar with. It gets terrible gas mileage. You know, for new technology to succeed, it can't be equal. It's gotta be better on all fronts. It's gotta be more efficient. It's gotta be faster. It's gotta be smoother. It's gotta do all of those. And this. This did one of those very well, just incredibly smooth, wonderful to ride, but gas mileage was not good. It was quirky. 
most Suzuki dealers could not fix it. In fact, a lot of dealers would sell it to you and go, uh, you're on your own, okay? I, there's no warranty here. Don't bring it, don't bring it back because we don't know how to fix it because you needed an RE5 guy to come fix it. I mean, it would be like having, buying your Ford GT down at Mel's Ford downtown where they just sell Focuses and Vans and, you know, whatever, Fusions, and they don't, uh, we don't know how to fix a Ford GT. And that's basically the case. So consequently, in some ways, it was its own worst enemy. They only made it for one year. Now, I know people are going to say, no, they made, made it in 76. No, the 76s were just leftover 75s they couldn't sell. They took off the Jajero speedometer here with, it. okay, the Bobby Rain Gun thing. No, that didn't work. Get rid of that. They took that off, just cleaned it up, made it look as much like a normal motorcycle as they could, much the way uh, Chrysler did with the airflow. The 34 airflow had the front end with the waterfall grill that looked like a streamlined train. People went, what is that? Okay, sorry. And they put a regular front end on it. And that's what they did with this. They got rid of this. Uh, these kind of look like the, uh, the uh, quote, piston, if you will, of a rotary. You know, it has all those design elements to it. Uh, I mean, look at the three holes here. And this, this mirrors the speedometer in the front. And these look like some sort of uh, the day the Earth stood still moving, you know, <laughs> like something aliens would have, some sort of pod. It's just a, it's just a crazy looking motorcycle. And, but I love it. Uh, it runs smooth, it runs cool. You've got this radiator here. That, of course, the radiator is probably bigger than it, well, not bigger than it needed to be, but bigger than they wanted, I think, because these do, did tend to run hot, so you needed a lot of space there. You had the electric fans. And this just scared a lot of bikes. You know, don't forget, in 75, bikes were pretty simple. You bought a Triumph, you kicked it twice, and it started. Thank you, you know? Uh, sure, you had to decoke the head every 5,000 miles or something, but that's okay. That's okay. It was easy to understand, and people know how to work. Nobody knew how to work on these. In fact, when I got it, what's that guy's name? Tim Johnson. He was very helpful. Um, he was extremely, he was one of these Suzuki RE5 guys, and you know, it is funny when you, you meet guys that collect this kind of stuff. You go to the house, and that's all they have is Suzuki RE5 parts. You know, the wife left years ago. The kids don't talk to them. The sinks are used as carburetor cleaner parts bins, you know. And they just, they just live for their bike, whatever it is. Well, it's a Harley Knuckle, whether it's this, whether it's a Triumph. Yeah, it's just funny. But anyway, take a look around. As you can see, kind of a cool-looking bike, something a little different. Again, you've got different oils you've got to carry engine oil, you got to carry gas, you got to have some injector oil. I mean, there's just, it was just more trouble than people thought it was worth. Not me, I love it, I think it's great. I just like anything different or unusual, you know. Uh, Norton built a rotary and that was pretty cool, but that didn't go anywhere either. The only one that made the rotaries work were Mazda. And what Mazda did was, as I mean, you know, the real trick to these is this seal. Okay, this seal right here at the end of the tip, where that comes around. When that wears, you lose compression. And what Mazda did was, at least the way I'm told, you know, they're one of these apocryphal tales. One of the engineers was sitting there one day and bouncing his pencil. He noticed how soft the lead was on the pencil. And he thought, hey, maybe that would work as the seal. And that's, again, one of those sort of simplistic tales, but that's kind of what they did. And Mazda made a great motor out of it. I love the Mazda rotaries, but even those eventually had to give up because they didn't get as good a mileage. It said in the handbook, please at least check the oil every other fill-up. People thought, oh, I'm, that's too much work to check the, every other fill-up. Oh, my God, I couldn't possibly do that. So that was a big turnoff for people. You know, Most people like to buy a car drive for two years, never check the oil, never change the oil, and turn it in, you know, like on a lease or something. I, I worked with somebody at NBC that did that, and one day the car just stopped. And I checked the dipstick, and it, it, there was nothing on it. It just, it just ran out of oil. And, I, and she just never checked it. Just, it. Okay. People don't like maintenance. And these were a little more self-indulgent, whatever, okay, but different, unusual, but great fun to ride. Come on, let's take it for a ride now. I'll show you what it's like. These are pretty cold blooded. It takes a long time to warm them up. But it's very addictive. It is so smooth.
But you see why the motorcycle testers raved about this bike. Well, you can't see it, but I see it. It's just so incredibly turbine-like smooth. It's, it's uncanny. If you ever get a chance to ride one of these, you should. Because as I said before, you know, I found these bikes either 50 or 100 miles or half a million miles. People either bought it as a collector's item and just put it away, or they just drove the hell out of them uh, until they literally wore out. Because it's such a great long distance bike. Oh, good, the light changed. Come on, let's ride some more. Remember, this is the only the equivalency of a 500cc bike, but it has all kinds of power. Those mirrors are just crystal clear, not one vibration. And I gotta give kudos to Harley Davidson for this jacket. You know, I got my other motorcycle jacket that I've had for 25, actually no, 40 years. Just the fact that it still fits me is amazing. But this thing is really warm. It's a cold day here in Los Angeles, cold for LA, you know, in the 50s. And this thing is just fantastic. The ray gun styling of this thing is really what makes it interesting. You either love it or you hate it, but it's so Japanese. And it just wants to rev forever. Ah, oh, so smooth. Doesn't get buzzy at high RPM. That's why you have to constantly watch the tack on this thing, because the next thing you know, you're pinning that tachometer. I always find the people that hate this bike most are the ones that never rode one. There were other motorcycles in the period that had a Wankel engine, the Hercules for one. Well, that was air cool. That was like a simpler, more industrial engine. It wasn't as sophisticated and complex as this thing with water cooling and, and all kinds of stuff on it. I mean, that was kind of slow. It, it was a nice commuter bike, but this thing, you, you could go cross country on it, no problem. And a lot of people did. I mean, the guys that are into these really love them. You just don't expect it to be so turbine-like. I mean, you go from a BSA Gold Star, which is like driving a bass drum, to one of these, oh my God, it's night and day. As I said earlier, somewhere off the coast of Japan, all the spare parts for this thing are in the middle of the ocean somewhere, which is a shame. You just find yourself bearing down on people because you realize you're always going 20 miles an hour faster than you thought you were just because of the sheer smoothness. And it's funny, it's got a Kickstarter on it. That, that, that's what kills me. And there's, is there a more 70s color than this? You know, if you're still watching this video, you probably already made up your mind. Either love this bike or you hate it. All I ask is, try not to form an opinion until you ride one. And then you go, oh my God, that's what everybody is talking about. I mean, the magazines are very predicted that this would be a huge hit. And of course, it turned out to be a tremendous failure, which was sad. It almost put Suzuki out of business. But we covered all that already. Anyway, ride one if you can, and uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks again. I'm going to smooth out of here.